Hello, my name is Nadine Bartlett, and I'm Assistant Professor of Inclusive Education at the University of Manitoba, and I'd also like to introduce Joel Boyce. Joel is a graduate research assistant, and he's also the Director of Education at the Louis Riel Institute. The topic of our panel discussion today uh, involves Indigenous perspectives on disability and diversity in education. At the University of Manitoba, we are committed to responding to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. And in our area of inclusive education, that involves um, partnering with Indigenous communities on infusing Indigenous perspectives into our teacher training. Uh, and we're doing so in partnership and in collaboration with the Manitoba First Nation Education Resource Centre. And we've been working directly with June Montour, who is their curriculum specialist uh, on this project and initiative. Um, in Inclusive Ed, we recognize that Indigenous worldviews about disability or difference that uh, have largely been excluded from inclusive education. The idea that disabilities are actually special gifts from the Creator has not really been present in Western and colonial uh, models of education. And so at U of M, we are really trying to infuse those pieces into teacher training. Um, and in doing so, we are uh, also collaborating with Indigenous elders. Um, we recognize that Indigenous elders, as Marie Baptiste has said, are living educational treasures and masters of traditional knowledge. So today, it's um, my pleasure to uh, welcome three Indigenous elders who are going to be sharing their perspectives on disability or difference. And they're also going to be providing suggestions for faculty, the university, as well as practicing teachers on how they might infuse Indigenous perspectives uh, into their teaching so that we can truly have schools that are inclusive of all. And now I'm going to invite Joel to uh, introduce our elders. We are joined today by Ruth Norton, who is an Anishinaabe from Seguin First Nation, Clementine Spence, who is Cree and an Anishinaabe from Peguis First Nation, and Maxine Anderson, who is an Anishinaabe from Penae Matang First Nation. And all of these elders are also educators. Uh, so now we'd just like to invite each elder to tell us a little bit more about where they're from and their teaching background. Well, maybe I'm probably the oldest one here, so... I've been in the education world for 50 years already. So I was a director of education, teacher, principal, and um, directors of ed director of education, and every other aspect of education. I was a counselor in, in uh, Ottawa, and I worked with the Crees in James Bay, and I worked with uh, people from right across the country. I just about went to every reserve. And so the best time that I had just recently is hearing the little ones, my little granddaughter, being able to speak to me in her language. And that's the highlight of my 50 years of education. That's all. My teaching background started when I was a young girl. Probably on my first day of school, I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to change the way I see an education in my community, in the school that I was at. and. Uh, I went home that first day, not by choice, but because I was sent home. And I told my mom, my dad, my mushum and my kokum, what happened at school. And I said, when I grow up, I'm going to be a teacher and I'm going to change that one thing. And uh, from then on, my grandparents encouraged me, always encouraged me to, uh, to be a teacher. They were... Uh, they were very keen on, on my being a teacher because there was a lady in our community, Verna Kurtness, and they knew Verna, they knew her parents really well. And so when, when they talked about me, it was with pride because they knew that someday I was going to be 
like Verna Jane Curtis. And my experience in school was not the best. And because of that, I wanted, I wanted that education to be my best. So when I started school, I knew that, uh, I knew that it, it was going to be up to me basically to change that around for myself. And so I endeavored to be the best English speaking student. And, and I did that at a cost because in doing that, I lost my language, I lost who I was, all my identity. Uh, that was that was uh, not a part of the education that I was growing up in. When I finished school in Fisher River, I started my uh, junior high in Peguis and graduated there uh, from grade nine and went to uh, grade ten in Brandon. And when I was in grade ten, there was no uh, opportunity given to me to to say that. I could go into a, a, uni, uh, a university stream, a general stream. It was, you know, that the old occupational entrance program that I, that I was streamed into. And uh, I always felt that was wrong. You know, like practically every year that I went to school, I noticed things that were different, that were wrong, that were being done to uh, my uh, peer group. And that was the one thing that I thought needed to be changed. I went to university in Brandon as a young mom, very much supported by my family, my uh, husband, my children, and uh, both of my mothers, my mother-in-law and my mother, were, were a big part of that education in, in helping me and supporting me. When I graduated in 1984, I went back to uh, Fish River and I taught at the uh, at Charles Sinclair School there for 12 years. And during that time, I gained a lot of experience in, in teaching, administration, counseling. I really appreciated that. And I also appreciated the fact that I was asked and allowed to go to many other communities, many other cities, provinces, to, uh, to learn more about you know, the Native education. Uh, that was the big thing coming out at that time, Native education. and. Uh, I thought that's what I want to do. I want to go into that. I want to, I want to ensure that the changes that I thought about as a, a young grade one student were going to be, were going to be taken seriously. I know that education, in the schools, in the university, were still very much, you know, the, the education of the of the mainstream society and uh, much learning about who. I was as a Cree and Ishnabe were were not there. They were just not there for me. When I uh, finished working in Fisher River, I made a choice to go to Edmonton, Alberta, to go to the University of Alberta, and I did that. And while I was there, I met some uh, some very good Aboriginal educators from the PAW, and. Uh, I also met a lot of uh, elders from from the northern area of, of Alberta, and I made it a goal, a personal goal, to learn as much as I could about who I was as Cree and Anishinaabe, and to learn about my culture, to learn about my language, and to learn all there was to know about who I was. And I thought. After that, then I then I really th I really thought I could I would be able to do those things in the schools that I worked at after that to teach to teach children about who they were. I was very fortunate that I that I applied to teach in Edmonton for another twelve years uh, in uh, in one of the schools there with Edmonton Public and really had good experience at Prince Charles School. Uh, predominantly uh, First Nation students there and uh, very much into uh, Native education. Really appreciated all the learning, the teaching I had there. I moved back home in 2010. I uh, retired from teaching. Uh, 
a couple of years later, uh, I was approached and asked to, uh, to, to go work at the school as an elder and to, to help with the elders program. And uh, that's where I'm at today. In, uh, in that program, I uh, meet a lot of our parents from our community. I share a lot of, a lot of what I think Native education is about. Uh, I get to meet a lot of our children uh, from the community, and I see their, you know, their strengths, their uh, abilities, uh, their keenness in uh, learning. And I think about the teachers, and I've worked with many of the teachers in our in our community. I was very fortunate that I. I was asked to be uh, an instructor for our uh, educational assistant program there, and which is sponsored by MFNERC here. Really, uh, really appreciate that. So I got to meet a lot of our young people that are working in our community, as, as well as the leadership there. So I'm very grateful, very thankful that I've had that opportunity and to be here with you as well. I, uh, my name is Maxine Anderson. My uh, experience as an educator began when I first had my children. I was their first teacher. I was in the school system for 38 years and uh, I always taught the children that whatever you teach a child, it is a gift from you. It, because of your experiences, you learn something. And uh, I uh, always stressed that. So when they were in a classroom and they were being taught that they should listen and take what was being taught, I told them that sometimes you don't use it. You don't use that gift right away. But someday you do. And... Uh, this uh, is important for Native uh, First Nation kids because they learn best with hands-on experiences. It sticks to their mind. And sometimes they'll say, oh, I learned that in school when so-and-so was my teacher. So that was a gift that they remember. And this is how I still teach my grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Thank you. Can you describe how you were raised to think about disability in your communities? And is it different from how non-Indigenous people think about disability in Manitoba school systems? Well, you know, I was brought up in the reserve, Saggy. And in my early times, from before residential school, went to residential school when I was six. And uh, before that, there, because it was all in Anishinaabe, you know, all the kids spoke the language. And there was a way. Like, I'm really uh, happy to say that I was brought up in a Nishinaabe way, where you don't speak in front of when elders are speaking and so on. So there, there's a tradition. There was a tradition there. There was honesty. There was respect. And your parents taught you that and your grandparents. And... The rest of the, the reserve also taught you different things, like your uncles, your aunties, and so on. So it was a community, what they call it now, community-based education. That's what we had. We certainly didn't have uh, time to, like, to be uh, involved in, in things that are going to harm you. Because there was always people there, like your aunties and so on, and they would be watching you to that you'd behave yourself and you'd learn to listen. 
but when you're talking about uh, people that were different as, as what we were learned, taught, we didn't see them as different, you know. You know, you call them disability people or someone who was, you know, mockshkat and stuff like that. Everybody was the same because everybody had a purpose. And that's what uh, our parents and our grandparents, aunties and uncles, like I, I come from a Kershane family, and they were very strict on how you behaved. And so when you, uh, we had a lot of people that had, as what you call, disability, but we never saw it as disability. Because in, in our way, and I should say prior to 1960, because that time we were in our reserve and we couldn't get out of there. That's, an, that's part of our history where the Indian agent kept us in our reserves. And so on one hand, it was good in terms of uh, the parents' um, way of teaching their kids. And the, uh, then the uh, grandparents and the old people, they, they were the ones in charge. They would never see a child being bratty or being smarty and whatever. They would always talk to you in a good way, in a Nishnabe. But after that, they would also come and see your parents. And so that, that's how I was brought up in Saging anyway. And um, that the disabled people, we never thought of them as disabled. They had a purpose. Like um, before I went to boarding school there, I lived uh, close to the Fontaines. And there was an old guy there, old Ephraim Fontaine, they called him, he's an old guy. But his work was to gather, to get water, because in those days we didn't have power and so on. And um, water and wood, and those Fontaines had a little farm. So that was his job. And some of the boys would come and help him. But he was... Um, I guess what they call challenge now, like in, in terms of your brain, because they people didn't know the Indian agent put him in the asylum because sometimes he would say different things, you know. And so Mr. Fontaine went and got his uncle to come back home. And to us, like the little kids, we didn't see him as crazy. He was, he just uh, was who he was. He was a hard worker, and um, he was really nice to have around old genus. And then, you know, other, other people, like, um, like the uh, Morsos, Breers, and all those, uh, we never thought of them as different. They were not different. They were part of our. They were the. They were the people of Saging, when they would walk on the road and so on. Some of them, you know, didn't. Uh, they had the serious disabilities, I guess. Now that I think of it, and some of them couldn't speak. But they would, you know, uh, kind of murmur uh, what they wanted. And anyway, but I, I never thought of them as different. And that's what I would tell teachers if I was training teachers on the whole issue of disability. You have to look at the person, a whole person. You have to look at them as human beings. 
And then it, and it also goes to the little ones. And granted, I know today is a different world. When I go to schools today, ay, ay, it's uh, pretty, pretty. Um, and getting, getting, I feel so bad for these little kids, the, the way that they've been, uh, well, how do you say that? Like, you, if they can't talk or so on, well, they're disabled, they say. They can't do that. They can't do this. And they can't do that. And I think to myself, that's not the way we were brought up. If somebody had that disability, you were kind to that person. So when our people talk about the teachings, one of the major things is the kindness tell you a little story because I like telling stories. I went to one one um, school here in the city. Well, I've been to quite a few. But I showed them uh, tapes of my mom in boarding school and my brother in boarding school and other people in Saguenay because I did a lot of tapes of people that were bo in boarding school and they were telling their story. Anyway, I showed this my mom's, and she's from, she was from Pegwis, and she's a funny lady. Anyway, so the kids were all sitting there on the floor, and I looked at this little boy. He was what they called disabled, couldn't uh, speak. And uh, after the tape ran out, he came over to me. And he hugged me, so I was hugging him, because he, he could hear, you know, but he couldn't really express himself. So that's fine. So I gave him a kiss on the head and hugged him and so on, this little guy. He was in grade two. So that's fine. All the other ones were normal, I guess, what you call them. Anyway, they, they were so interested in what my mom had to say about her time. So anyway, I was going out the door. All of a sudden, this little boy ran, ran after me. When he's, uh, I guess they have special people there that look after them, they aids and stuff. Pajibi, Jata, you know, when he came over. And he hugged me again. And here he went and into the, he went outside and he got a rock. And he, he was holding me like this over here and then he gives me this little rock. It's a little red rock. And he, he you know, he kisses my hand and he, and I, what an incredible little boy. And they call him a disabled boy. He's not disabled up here, and he's not disabled in his heart. Mm -hmm. And that's what I found. And that's what the elders said a long time ago. Because somebody can't walk right doesn't mean their heart is disabled. And so disability, uh, these teachers will have to uh, think about what that word means. That's my story right now. <laughs> by the way, I kept that rock and it's by my bed. Living in Fisher River, and in answer to this question, you know, regarding disability, we knew there were people that, that had physical disabilities. And... Uh, but those people, you know, uh, that were there in our community, from the young one to the old one, they didn't let that stop them from being that person they wanted to be. And I think it's, it comes down to perspective. How do we define disability? I know today in, in education circles, you know, we think of disability as all those labels that are given to a child to say, you know, you're this, you're dyslexic, you're this, you know, you're autistic, you're this, you know, 
all those different labels. And I know that today, you know, uh, there are more and more labels coming up. Even as we're sitting here, there's probably some that are in the making. But back then, as a child, I thought about being in that school and thinking, you know, about this teacher that was labeling us in his own way because he didn't think our language was appropriate, you know, and uh, doing everything in their power to stop us from speaking that language to each other, which was a natural thing to do. This was our gift from the Creator, and uh, we have this person, you know, that's an authority over us that is taking that away from us. And uh, I go back to my first few days of uh, school because those are the experiences that have shaped who I am today. He went home to my parents, to my mom and dad, and he told them never to speak to me in Cree again. And they didn't. You know, that's how much they respected, you know, this teacher because they were taught to respect, you know, the teacher elders in our community. My grandparents were there my mushroom and my kokum, and they didn't understand what the man said, so I'd go to them, and they continued speaking to me in their language. My uh, mushroom's language was Anishinaabe, my, my grandma's language, my kokum, was Cree. So I was getting both, you know. I was very fluent in both languages until the day I set foot in that school, and that's the day that I was told, you know, you don't ever speak your language again. And I think that was the greatest I wouldn't even call it a disability in that sense, but, you know, the greatest uh, dishonor that they did to our people was labeling us as uh, disabled because we spoke a different language from them. And I know that many of our people are, have been affected and impacted by that. I think about, I think about how our elders look after the ones that that just couldn't keep up at times. And they were the grandmas, they were the aunties that looked after the little children. Uh, and as they got older, they became self-sufficient. They still were not able, in some instance, were not able to walk, but they were self-sufficient. Some of them were not able to speak, but they could say exactly what they wanted in their own way and still be self-sufficient. I think the thing there was between the parent and those aunties, grandparents, uncles that were teaching this child, there was a mutual respect for each other. They were not told their child couldn't do this or couldn't do that. They knew, but they were also making sure this child had every available opportunity to do the things that he or she was capable of doing. And not once did that child, uh, not once was were those children ever apprehended, you know, and put in a in an asylum or in a in another area, a home, far away from from our people, far away from their parents. And to me, growing up, I thought about that. I thought about you know my first teachers, you know, my grandma, my mom. And especially my grandma, I thought, well, that's, that's who I want to be like, to love this child unconditionally, but at the same time to teach them to be self-sufficient within their capabilities, within the skills and gifts that they have received. And I think about how growing up we knew that we were a part of that child's life, even our peer group, that we could help each other and I grew up with, uh, I grew up as a young, as a young girl with very poor eyesight, and so I didn't have eyeglasses. I didn't get eyeglasses until I got into junior high. But my first year in junior high, you know, a lot of a lot of the, my peer group knew that I couldn't see, and I had one girl that sat beside me, and we had to take notes off the off the chalkboard. So she would take the notes and give them to me to copy. And uh, 
that the teacher in that year, and I was in grade six, they allowed it. You know, and I, I was very surprised that they would allow that. Going into the next year, however, you know, they put a stop to that. And I always wondered why, you know, like it was not, it was not cheating. She was helping me. And that's how, you know, when we talk about, you know, helping in our community, that kindness, that caring to look out for each other, that's all this young lady was doing for me. And I appreciated that. But that was taken as, as well. And, you know, when I think about those things, when I think about the experiences and the actions of individuals, and especially those in authority, I thought about how, how they seen that in their, from their own thoughts, from their own perspective, and to, to make it, in a way, a negative experience. I still think that, you know, today, we still see that. We still see that disability in, in an individual as something that has to be fixed. And, and to me, you know what, sometimes that fixing needs to be within us before we can help someone else. And I have to always, you know, ask myself, like, are you going to enable or are you going to be an abler to make sure that that person has all the, all the experiences, all the opportunities given, you know, to, to make themselves sufficient within, like I said, within their, within their capabilities, their gifts, and their own experiences. I sometimes think, too, that uh, today, school systems across the land, you know, they, they still have it wrong about our people, mm. you know. They still have it wrong because uh, it, it was maybe within the last decade, if, if even that, that there was very little emphasis placed on, on education of, our, of who we are as First Nations, about our history, our culture. Very little. Growing up, I didn't know that, you know. Uh, growing up, I was, uh, you know, the few times we'd get to see a movie, you know, it was always cowboys and Indians, and, you know, we, we didn't realize, you know, that these people were us. And that hasn't changed over the years. So I think it's up to us today as educators, as elders, to teach our children who they are and, and to do it in a good way to make them, to make them think differently about their, their capabilities, to, to, say to, to say to themselves, you know, I matter. And I think education today, all across the board, all across the country, needs to think about how each child matters, that uh, we, we have that right we have an inherent right, you know, to, to our own education, to our own systems, to teach about who we are, to teach our language, our history, and our culture. And I, I'm so thankful, you know, that when I start talking to friends, to family, that mm -hmm. there are many of us knowledge keepers out there that are saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I dare say that, you know, if we ever all got together you know, how tremendous that would be, you know, that, that giving of what we know. You know, we have a lot of uh, educational conferences, you know, in our country here. But sometimes I think, you know, we honor those educators, but sometimes those educators come out and, and they are the experts in Native education, whether or not they have set foot in, a, you know, in, in our land. So I think it, this is, uh, I think there is time. There's time that should be given to allow our knowledge keepers to be a part of this like you have. And I would say, you know, have more. Have more of us there with you when you're, when you're offering these programs. Go out into the communities and start talking to those people, sitting down with them like the way that we have been doing and doing it from a sense of, uh, of honoring those elders. Like th this morning we had, you know, the, the tobacco presented to us, uh, getting to talk about some of the protocol, 
you know, learning about those things beforehand. I, I really think that, you know, we could dispense about, you know, this, these thoughts about disabilities. Because each one of us is disabled, has a disability, if we continue with this thought. Mm -hmm. Because I think we can do better for our own. I, mm -hmm. How I was raised is uh, like a book. It's, uh, I was raised by my uh, grandparents and then my aunties. My mother died before I was four and then I had two younger siblings. And, uh, but growing up, you, uh, you never saw any disabilities in a child or anyone. Mm -hmm. Any disability you saw was maybe a limp or uh, there was uh, no uh, limbs missing or anything that's visible. The disabilities they may have had we never knew. These disabilities that the kids have nowadays are self-induced by mothers and passed on to their unborn child. And uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I grew up with grandparents, so that was uh, an experience. When I was uh, 19, I was nine years old, my uh, grandparents' home burned, and two of my grandmother's siblings died in that fire, and we were thrown out from the upstairs window, and then wrapped in horse blankets. That's, uh, my mother, my grandmother died a few days after. So there was three that perished in that fire. And uh, from there on, we were, you know, you went to one aunt and then to the other one and then to another aunt. You were passed around like a little puppy, I'll say. <laughs> That's how I always think when I, uh, when I think about my childhood. It was... Uh, hard to grow up, but there was always something in here mm. that wanted something better. Excuse me. Mm. <laughs> you need some water? Yeah. <coughs> I was... Uh, when I started school, I spoke only Soto, and uh, if I dropped my pencil, I w we, there was a big um, open fire like down in the basement there, but there was a grid on there with big holes, eh? and if you dropped your pencil, it went down. And then I would sit there without a pencil, not working. And then, uh, of course, I didn't know how to ask for a pencil or to tell where my pencil went. And then the teacher would get mad at me, put me in a corner. And, um, and then I would uh, tell my, uh, my cousins, they were older, and uh, so they would give me a pencil. And then I was able to do whatever. I don't know what I did. I don't remember what I wrote or if I wrote anything. I didn't know that between yes or no. I didn't know what they meant. All I did was spoke my language. Nowadays, 
kids are um, are so uh, I don't know how to say that word there so distracted from the natural world I'll say mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. all the technology mm-hmm. the different I see you know um, when we were growing up we were made to work mm-hmm. we had our own chores before school and after school there was water to be brought to be picked up and it was a walk about a mile and wood to be brought in and different things meals to prepare you were never without things to do you were never bored and when you played you made your own games and you made your own dolls, you made your own ball to play ball with. Those are the things that I used to tell a student in a classroom. And this uh, grade six students there, when they would come to my class, they would say, teacher, tell us about the old days when you were young. <laughs> <laughs> and this is... Uh, I used to tell them that, and uh, they said, my granny never tells us stories, you know. So it was something that they wanted to hear, the difference in my lifetime and in in their time. So it was something that I shared, and uh, Another thing is uh, the children that are being fostered. Mm -hmm. Those children are, you know, they're traumatized. And these problems stem from there because they're not accepted, they're not respected, and they don't either because they they think they're different. They think there's something wrong with them. They blame themselves. I um, had three foster kids. They were my my grandchildren. When the mother was, when my daughter had them, they took the two girls first. And then she had another boy. And she, she said, I'm going to nurse this baby. And she nursed that baby. And about maybe a week to 10 days old, ACFS came and took that baby. And my daughter was walking around like this, you know, her breasts hurting. And, you know, seeing that, I I just, I didn't know what to think. And uh, after that time, she left the community. She was, mm, stayed in a city. I don't know what kind of a life she had there. She wouldn't come home. And she would go into Ontario. And uh, she had friends, I guess, she lived with. But those uh, those things or that happened stem from uh, that uh, losing her children. You know, see, and these, these children now have problems. They all have problems. And uh, another thing is uh, young parents that start families early when they're young. And they have baby after baby after baby. And uh, they don't uh, know how to handle kids, their kids, because there's so many 
at once I'll see. And uh, they, uh, they just get so frustrated. They, uh, they get depressed. When, um, when I first got married, uh, my mother-in-law was very loving. And uh, when I first brought my granddaughter home, my first daughter home, she said, you go in the bedroom and you rest. For one month, she looked after me. She didn't even let me wash a bottle or wash a dish or cook. All, she, all I did was make the formula for the baby, change the baby, just look after the baby. But she made me uh, rest for one month. She says, this is how we were taught when we had babies. That way, you become strong. Mm -hmm. And then you're ready to take full responsibility. There were many things that I learned from my mother-in-law. She was my mother and mother-in-law. She mm -hmm. taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm talking too much. Oh, <laughs> no, you're no, doing that. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I made uh, lots of notes here. Just whatever came to my mind. They're not even in, uh, in um, sequence or whatever. But I tried to uh, include some things that I thought would be important to, to share. And... Uh, and that's uh, one of the things I, I wanted to share is because of the way the kids are nowadays. Mm -hmm. They have all kinds of, they're diagnosed with all kinds of disabilities. And sometimes it's not proper. Sometimes they'll say ADHD, uh, you name it, they have it, you know, autism. Where were these before? Did we get them from the foods, from the drugs? Because it seems like everybody is on one kind of pill or another. If you're a diabetic, you take about, what, 10, 15 pills, <laughs> you know? And what are they doing to your body? Mm. And a lot of young people have diabetes when they're young, too. Mm -hmm. And then they're still having children. So that must do something to an unborn child. Okay. Anyway, that's what I thought disability was. Disability is uh, something, I guess, that is ongoing. If you have it, it's ongoing. Mm -hmm. But there are choices to take. And I'll stop there. Hi. When you're, you were t talking about uh, having your children, I had six boys and one girl when, uh, when I lived in the reserve. But the reason why I'm uh, sharing that is uh, it reminds me of my first husband, Marcel Fontaine's uncle, George Fontaine, he would go in the bush and he would go and get medicine, medicine for afterbirth. Mm -hmm. And like what you were saying, like each time I had, like my first one was a girl and then six boys. And... Um, he would come every day and he'd bring a, a big jar of medicine and I had to drink it all day mm -hmm. till the next morning. And he would do that for a month. And he was the one that, that took care of uh, the uh, woman after birth. That's what they called it in Chicago. 
So there was no baby blues. No baby blues, nothing. And then after that, I went to work. But <laughs> I, after the uh, uh, this, the second youngest one, I told uh, Marcel's uncle, "I'm not drinking your stuff anymore." <laughs> I keep having kids. <laughs> he stood there, that old guy. He said, well, you know what? It's not my fault. <laughs> but they were so funny, too, and, you know, in, in those times. And, but uh, they sure took care of us. You know, because one of my uncles was, uh, he also was a uh, medicine man, like it going in the bush to get your medicine. Still today they go and get medicine. We go and get our medicines and so on for the for the kid for 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 the woman. But usually it's women that will do for the woman, right? Mm -hmm. But in that case it was what it was was the two Mrs. Crushane and Mrs. Fontaine, old ladies. Therese Charbonneau, they were Charbonneau women. And they um, they didn't have girls until later on, but it was all boys. And the, and the Charbonneau, Fontaine, and Christine's a lot of, not a lot of boys first. Mm -hmm. So those two old ladies, my grandmother and her sister, and uh, they taught they, they took one one of their sons, who was the fourth son, and they taught them how to get the medicines for the woman. So they had their yeah their their own way to uh, mm -hmm. to help the woman. But then the uh, grandmothers would come, like you say, and and help you with um, your children, mm -hmm. how you wrap them up and. Mm -hmm. when you sing to them, when you talk to them, and so on. But there's another side to that, that whole area of how we, we uh, lived in our own environment and the way that we lived our lives. You see, in, uh, in Anishinaabe and all of, uh, other... Um, people across the country. They really believe in uh, Unjine. Unjine Tawiya. And that's the opposite of good and Unjine mm -hmm. because of your, the way that you, you uh, dealt with the animals and so on. And that when we came out of boarding school, we didn't know any of that because all, all our, what we were supposed to know was uh, taken out of our heads because they beat us like you wouldn't believe for 10 years I was there. So you were always scared to, to kind of go with, you know, uh, the Anishinaabe way. But I was lucky because my dad never went to school, but my mom did. But my dad was a strong man, John Kershane, mm -hmm. and he really knew the Anishinaabe way. To go get the Anishinaabe medicines. And so when I would hear um, about Unjene, that's an that's such an incredible, incredible uh, word in our language. Mm -hmm. And I know people across the country, they talk about that because there's good and there's evil, right? And for every, it doesn't matter who you are. Unjene, awiya, it goes on the kids. And uh, what happened to us, to me, was uh, uh, my first husband, Marcel, 
he was uh, a victim of everything that happened in the in the residential school and he didn't really um, want to listen because lots of things happened to him anyway this old man that would always come and give me Indian medicine when I was having my kids came the first time when I started when I had my first baby he be Jaina George and at that time, he was my first husband. And he had, uh, he chased the dogs when they were mating. Mm -hmm. And he would uh, shoot them while they were mating. Mm -hmm. And that's the most horrible thing that you could do. Mm -hmm. And George, or Uncle George, I'll call him, he be Jaima. My little girl was born June 17th, and she was breech. And her little arm was twisted around her head. And the doctors in Pine Falls in the White Hospital, they were looking after me, but after one of the other doctors took her. And um, ever since that time now, my daughter, I only had one daughter. And the old people came. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They couldn't help her with her with her arm. So her arm is always like this to this day. The other thing is because you were you had to live through those the the way that we were. You couldn't go across the old man, old George, and the old ladies like the grandmothers. Because mm -hmm. what we wanted to do was bring it to a white doctor to fix her arm. And the old people said, Gayla, wash me, Taije, I've been on to If you go over to the white doctor, he could talk, she'll be worse. So we didn't. And those were the rules. And so that some of these teachers will have to understand what that means on Jene because he a be a a king. Me nange curse. Me ye kai kitwak jinishnavik me wisha. Disability. Rufus Goodstriker, 
на Алберда Унджа. Гиша, а вы сте говорили, свет стабита. Мил гидте жендания. Дисабилитис. Шигал унджини, вен. Инге. Шкая, сакчи, кента, мото, вони, унджини. Because today we have so many kids that are in care. And that that word unjine goes to the whole tribe. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of my um, friends down east are in Manitou and I'm lying in jail. Чего Эйки двадцать чинеш наве. Кина, кая хватума, а бен он жия кайже тот, он женеок, он женеок кетвак век чинеш наве. А же кина, има чаок, каги кента мату кнене, он женевен. Митасие че кента мат. Кинал магая вот, шкая сак, шикен да мото гнене. Он жене means curse, and that's a curse that was put for some reason. Кина went on же, and one elder told me from Nova Scotia. Yeah, Probably newer. She's passed away, my friend. She said it's because we didn't carry on our languages. Me, I, you own your name, and and so it's it, it's quite um, a hard thing to understand. And I tell my my kids, the one that understood is the one that died. Up in the pond, Derek. Ogi can dano kun in there. On Jinevan. But the other ones are gradually dis- understanding what that means. And so I don't know if our young people will understand what we're talking about that on Jine. Or in white words, I guess it's curse because we didn't listen, or something happened. Now the kids are the ones that are, are affected. We have so many disabilities, and the, one of my one of the elders said, "We allowed those social workers to come into our reserves." And that's on Genewin because we allowed them to come there. We should have fought for those kids when they were taking them away. Mm-hmm. Back in 1980, there was a social worker in our reserve. She happened to be staying with my mom and dad. My dad said, you know, you don't have a place here. Your social worker, whatever that means, You know, when a child is born, that's the Creator gives it to the mother and father, not you. You're not there. You are not there. And so, when we allowed the social workers and other people to come into our reserves to take those kids, that was the curse that we put on those kids. And now today, those kids 
Those young mothers, they can't even go and see their kids without a social worker there. I see that in the schools that I go to. It breaks my heart. I feel like throwing her out. <laughs> I mean, that's awful. Talk about being disabled. That lady, those young mothers are being disabled of their children. Like, what is she going to do? She's trying to hold her little girl, and the social worker is sitting between them, disabling her. There's lots of things you can say about this disabilities. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that really hurts me when I see that, when that little, that young woman can't even hold her baby. Like, who is the social worker? Not a... Well, the Creator didn't tell her to do that. Yeah. Well, whose laws are those? And that's, you know, universities and whatever, colleges and whomever's teaching these people, they should tell them those kind of stories that you don't have the business to go in between a mother and a little baby. Even though, you know, you say, oh my God, you can't... Um, you can't take your baby. Well, why not? Oh, because you're on drugs, and you're on this, and you're on that. Well, she, yes, of course. She probably needs drugs for something else. I don't know. But at least give her the baby to hold. She carried that baby in her womb for nine months. And then they just whisk them away, and that's awful. It, that really bothers me when I see that in, in those little schools. And I think they're, you know, the whole child welfare has to, uh, I know that people say, oh, well, we need child welfare and so on. Yes, of course, to a certain extent. But don't be uh, taking the whole the kids away. These kids that I was teaching last year, they think they're they're Filipino now. Now they're thinking they're uh, East Indian. All these kids that are in care, pa kacha, dani win the mokshan shnavik shagin. Oh no, I gotta go. I'm gonna go to my country, they say. That's what they say in schools. I sit with those little kids. <laughs> That's what I'm doing now as a great grandma. What's pa kacha? What, uh, what does that mean? What? Pa kacha. You're saying that. Oh, look, I'm saying it wrong. But what's that mean? Pa kacha. It's a it's a word that is is that's next to killing somebody, like you're very dis dis leveled, like when you're kind of upset, you know, when you see oh. something bad. Yeah. Okay. That's what we mean by pakach. When you look at them pakach, because they'll sit between the little girl and the mother. Mm -hmm. See if I got you. Yeah. yeah. Well, we say that one too, but Pakach, we say. Anyways, Miigwech. What can university faculties and teachers do to integrate Indigenous perspectives in order to ensure the inclusion of students from diverse backgrounds and with diverse needs? Maybe these universities, colleges, and higher up uh, educational places to come down to earth once in a while. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, kind of, not kind of, start looking at the people out there. You know, I'm talking about disability, holy man. There, there are disability and but there's a reason for it too and so I think universities that are up here 
should come down a little bit. I mean, I've been gone to many universities, and uh, I have a master's from Carleton University. That was a good one. And uh, but some, I believe that they're in a rut because they figure that they're the ones that know everything. And we'll train your head in order to go out there to work. You see, that's how uh, I see universities and colleges. Granted, you have to have a, a B.Ed. and a B.A. and an M.A. and so on. All those we have. But there's a whole part that's missing. And that's to really look at the, especially our people, to look at the reserve people and how they live and what their culture is all about, what their languages are all about, how they, they live from day to day and how they're struggling to keep their children and so on. If it's the faculty of social work and all those, then they have to go 50% with the communities. Ours, anyway. Probably the white, white communities are fine with whatever education institutions they have in whatever province. But for ours, for the reserves, they have to really... Um, have respect for them that they know something. Mm -hmm. In particular, our kids. We know about our kids. The Creator gave us the kids and they gave us the, our grandchildren and they gave us the responsibility to take care of them. And so the universities should be doing a lot of more on the ground stuff and not be in their ivory towers so much. I suppose there's nothing wrong with ivory towers. You love that kind of work. But to me, if you're looking at training the teachers who are going to be teaching disabled children for us, then they better know the background and they better know it from the reserves. Go out to the communities, go out to the, com like what you're doing here. Go and see the, the Kokums and the grandpas. Because, you know, across the country, I, I didn't see too many professors on the go to reserves to go and just sit there and listen. I took old John Weens once up to Cross Lake. He was some kind of big shot at Seven Oaks. I, I forget what his title was, but anyway, he's now a professor at the University of Manitoba. And I saw him the other day at, at the church for Don Robertson when he died. But anyway, I said, uh, you're still trying to be a big shot up there? He said, yeah, I know. <laughs> I took him up to Cross Lake. Oh, my God, and we, we had so much fun with the um, elders. The elders just took him in, because he's a pretty good guy. Eh? He likes to laugh and everything else. Because I young, he out for a week. We stayed there for a week. But the reason why Rebecca and I brought him there was for him to tell us what kind of school he has and what they were teaching the kids mm -hmm. and how they were teaching them and how the parents were involved or the parents, you know, the bosses of the schools, could they go in? And it was really a good, a good place for him. He realized 
how the different educational systems were between, you know, theirs and ours. And um, to this day, <laughs> he still tells me, why'd you take me up there? I said, to educate you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I think the universities, that would be a good thing for if they could go to the to the communities and and not be a, a highfalutin big shot going there you know and sometimes i i really tell the, these young people you're just like these ones that come from the universities and they're our own you go pinta ge otima you know like there are big shots coming into our schools. <laughs> but I guess what I'm trying to say, you, they need to look at us as we're, we're nations of people that have been here for thousands of years. And we know the kind of land that we have. We know the waters. We know our histories and so and we know yet our languages and so these university faculties are just babies in the opinion of some of the elders that I worked with you know we've been here for thousands of years and so we still follow that. And the biggest thing is that respect. Mm -hmm. We need these people to respect our communities. That's all I guess I have to say. I have a lot to say. I'll be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, really, I really appreciate what you, what you say about you know, our elders, those that know in our community, the knowledge keepers. There, there are so many of us, but at the same time, you know, when I, I, I study my community and, and, and I look at who's there and, and who's gone on, and I'm thinking, oh, another one, you know? And we're, we want to get their stories to share with our children, and I think you said it best, you know, when you talk about how we have to make sure we teach our children those laws that are that govern us as a first nation you know we don't write them down you know they're oral and we pass them on to our children to to whomever is around is around us i remember growing up you know in that way when you talk about looking after the children I honestly thought I had six brothers when I was growing up, you know. At that time, those were my brothers. And later on in life, I, I found out only one of them was my blood brother. But today, I still consider, you know, all those men now, they're, they're all men. I still think of them as my brothers. And uh, we talked about, you know, moms that struggled after the babies were born. And the children that that were affected, you know, by that mom's personal health and uh, issues and the struggles she was going through, well, those children were given, you know, in, in a very kind way to that mom over there that's breastfeeding, you know, and uh, that's how that's how I got to know and meet some of my brothers, and. We talked one time, I, I was at a funeral there about maybe 20 or so years ago, and uh, I just happened to be at a table where all my brothers were. And I was so glad to see one of them. And he's sitting there with his wife, and I said, Oliver, I am so glad to see you, my brother. And I never realized, you know, how that sounded, you know? Because to me, he's my brother, but his wife doesn't know that. And, and the other people sitting around didn't know that, but he knew. And I was always their, their sister, you know, their, their little sister. And uh, 
we we gave each other that uh, support that children only children can give to each other, knowing that you know that you know his family lived down the river from us, and uh, when he went when he went back home, I cried and I cried and I cried because I didn't know what happened to my brother, and then when my mom finally told me she said he'll be back, and you know through the years growing up. He came back, you know, he'd come and visit, talk to us. And so I think our community with their with their laws, you know, our First Nations with their laws, even of child rearing, looking looking out for each other, I think they had it right. You know, like my brother was not one that we could keep forever because he had to go back to his family. But he would come back to us. You know, it was always back and forth, back and forth. And our families, like we grew up together, we knew each other. And to me, there was no, the love I had for my blood brother was no different from the love I had for Oliver, because he was my brother. He, they taught me all those things that I needed to be taught not having a big sister in my family. And so I think about our people and how they looked out for each other. And I tell children and families today, you know, we didn't have CFS back then. We didn't have a welfare system back then because we looked out for each other. There was no question about it when you were asked or, or you just offered to look after somebody else, whether it was a baby, a child, uh, another mom or dad, or an, an elder. You know, there, we had no personal care homes. We didn't have that in our community. We didn't have a CFS office or building in our community, no safe houses in our community. We didn't have those because we were the ones that provided and looked out for each other. I think if we go back to the teachings, you know, to what, to what the Creator has given us, all the gifts that He has given us, and if we look at the rules of those teachings, we can't go wrong. We cannot go wrong. And we look at, you know, the animals that are represented in that teaching, those animals around us, and how they live, and how they provide for us, and how they take care of us, and support us with, with what they have. And I think if we give back to them, you know, it's, it's like a, that whole life cycle, that circle of life, where we depend on each other, where we have to look out for each other. I think our, our people knew that from way back. And that is what they offered, you know, the, the, the first people that came into, into Turtle Island, you know, that they offered them all those gifts so that they could survive. And uh, I think over the years, you know, I don't know what it was like back then. I can, I can certainly imagine. But today, you know, when, when we look at our people in our country, we look at the turmoil, and it goes back to the teachings. It goes back to that, those teachings of respect, of kindness. And it's in every culture, you know, no matter your background. Teachings are, are similar in every culture. And if we could only just step back and think, you know, I can do things differently. I can think differently. And I can be taught differently. It goes back to teachings, you know, like, like how our parents, our grandparents taught us. You know, my grandmother, my grandfather, they never taught me by a book. It was walking with them. You know, when, they, when they, they would teach me, I was walking with them, or I was sitting beside my grandma, or I was with her when she was out in the community delivering babies or looking after sick people, I was with her. When she went out in the bush to pick up medicines, I was with her. And so I realized that today, you know, that it was the best teaching that I ever had, that from the heart. And, and the blood memory that goes back with those teachings from like thousands of years ago are still with us today. And we don't have to look far for that. All we have to do is say those prayers and, you know, show respect to the elders 
and it, it comes flooding back on you that, yeah, you know what? I have to do this. This is what I have to do to walk that good path, to be kind to somebody, to teach others. And I said it earlier, you know, and, and I will say it again. What can we do today? We should be able to work together, you know, on the same level, not not a having a division, you know, up here, down here, all on the same level. And it should be, you know, if uh, we're, we're talking about communities, you know, I would, I would invite you, you know, to come to our community, sit down with us, talk to us, learn from us, we'll learn from you. Because up to now, it has been a one-sided educational system. Now, I think if we want our country to be healthy and well, you know, I think we have to start learning about each other from each other. And to say, you know what, you need to know more about us, who we are as individuals. I, I really feel that all those things, you know, that have happened within the last five, six hundred years, there's a lot to be said about why things happened. And there's, you know, research, there's books written about it. But I think sometimes in the telling, we overlook that one thing, and that's to just sit down and listen. Listen with our heart. Listen with those eyes of the grand grandparents, you know, the grandmothers, the old ones, those that knew, if we listen from their heart, from their eyes, from their knowledge, I really believe that we could now have a dialogue about all these teachings and how we can take from each other and to, and to make it a better place for, for our people, for our children, for those to come, because we have a big responsibility you know, as elders, we have a big responsibility to teach that. And sometimes, you know, we say too, you know, we're looked down on because, you know, like who do we think we are to try and teach you about how it was or the way it was? You know, where do you get that? So we continue, we struggle, we persevere in teaching because that's how we grew up. I, and I, I listen to these ladies' stories, I've known them, and I know that, you know, they've, they've met with a lot of adversity in their, in their lives. And so we know what it is to struggle, to be accepted for who we are. And I think we've come to that realization now that, you know what, we don't even have to do that anymore. We're here because of those lessons that we've learned. And now, you know, it, it is our time now to share it with you, with our children, with our communities. In doing that and always giving back to our community, I think that's, that's the big thing, to give back to our communities all the knowledge that we have, to share it in a good way. And I, if the the universities, the colleges could, could, learn, could learn that today, I, I would encourage each and every one to start doing that, to, fi to find out where these children come from, where these university students are coming from, their, their background, because I have family there that are doing this. And I would like them to have that experience in a better way than I received it. And as an, as an adult, you know, going to university, you know, th that was such a, it, it, it was very uh, trying at times, you know, to, to get this education from the perspective of that uh, ma majority of people, the, the non-Native community. It, it was very trying because I had knowledge, I had blood knowledge knowledge from the heart, from my, from my elders, from my grandparents. But it was not a part of that at that time. 
I think today we've, we're starting to, you know, get on that journey in that circle to bring it back home. But we're, we're not halfway there yet. It, it, we're, we're doing our initial steps to get it back. And, but it's not only us people. It's not only up, up to the First Nations because it has to be with all nations then to, to truly you know, believe that we can be who we are to, to make decisions for what we want to do and to do it in a good way for our people so that those that are coming will know we thought about them because I think that's the worst thing we can do is go on in our journey and leave this world the way it is today. I think we owe our ancestors, those today and those to come, better than that. So we need you, but we need you to be part of who we are at a level playing field in our communities. I was thinking about the right to an education. Why I want to bring this up is about the children who are being sent home from school and that there's never any follow-up. Now the new teachers coming need to have the education or the knowledge to uh, know how to deal with them. So how do how do they how do we deal with them? Um, I had the uh, some things jotted down here, like the old proverbs. Uh, it takes a community to raise a child. Mm -hmm. What happened to that? Mm -hmm. We lost it somewhere. Yeah. You know, now it's the parent going full throttle and trying to do this and that, but nothing works because he's alone. It's, and it's usually single parents. There's very few families who have two parents in the family now. Uh, it seems like nobody wants to make a commitment. And uh, I think uh, two um, First Nation kids like to uh, do things with their hands. I think that should be taught. You know, and they learn and they retain that. Um, I think once a teacher comes to the community, we oh, tell you one teacher we had. He was a, a minister, also a principal in our school. And uh, when he first came, he didn't have a vehicle. So he walked everywhere. And he walked and he visited every home before he started school. Mm -hmm. And uh, if there was a problem with a child, he went to that home. He went and visited that home so that child would see him there. Eh? Mm -hmm. And uh, he was uh, an Englishman. He had shoes, I bet you about this long. <laughs> And when he walked, he walked. <laughs> and uh, anyway, the, the kids really respected him because there was kind of a, I don't know, power walking by you. <laughs> and uh, they, they, they listened. And, uh, but that was, that's what I thought many times for teachers to visit the homes, to see where the child is coming from mm -hmm. daily, mm -hmm. what their home is like, and like getting down to their level. And then this way, you know, oh, this child, you know, maybe this child has not very much, but he's still coming. Maybe the other child there has lots, and this child will 
put down this other child. You know, they're the ones who are making the, I'll say, the separation from uh, bonding together, I'll say. Um, when, um, when the child is sent home from school, what happens? The child goes home, first thing they do, turn on a television and they'll sit there all day and watch TV or their games now. And uh, nothing is learned. All they do is just so fast, the uh, technology. And uh, th I think that has to, uh, something has to happen within the community to get back and work as a team, like the parents, the school, or whoever, the teachers. Um, they need to know uh, the family, the families they're working with, and the community, like the culture, like you all say, that you covered. And when you speak to the children, to be specific. <coughs> uh, like example, how are you today? And they'll look at you. Okay. So, you know, that's how they answer. Mm -hmm. But if you're specific, say, what made you smile to that child today? You know, what made you frown? You know, or did you stop that kid from doing something negative? You know, stuff like that to teach the kids to be aware that they can also help mm -hmm. with another child's behavior. Mm -hmm. Because if you learn that at home, you can pass it on to others. And if you learn it at school, you'll use it at school. Then we would have maybe the bullying toned down because bullying is, mm -hmm. is just unbelievable sometimes in schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, the children, the students now don't have any respect for anything. You know, sometimes you'll see a child running down the hall and they'll kick the ball. Or the, usually there's uh, lockers in the hall, they, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll kick them or they'll be hitting them. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and when you do that, they open and mm -hmm. they'll peek in there, maybe take something, you know. That's mm -hmm. not right when you're uh, taking something that doesn't belong to you. So a lot of times it's teaching the kids the ba basics mm -hmm. and uh, that's what I, th I think, what I see. Like, to make, uh, not to make, but to teach, to train the children to be more, uh, to take control of themselves, mm -hmm. to, uh, to uh, I don't know, what I'm trying to say is, uh, to be more responsible for their own behavior. Mm -hmm. Because this is what a behavior has a lot to do with uh, the school, in, in the school mm -hmm. in behavior. Mm -hmm. But doesn't that stem too from what we perceive as behavior right away, the negative behavior? There's always that, you know, uh, punishment. Yes. But we don't realize but That's if you a turn it, yeah, like what you're saying, they turn it into a positive. Yes, turn it into a positive. Teach them respect. Mm -hmm. Yes, like uh, those uh, the teachings of uh, the seven teachings. Mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I used to display them in my classroom all the time, and mm -hmm. I sometimes picked one 
Mm -hmm. And just talked about it there. Mm -hmm. What do you think that means? Mm -hmm. You know? And you remind them, you know, and, uh, look at number four or, you know, number mm -hmm. seven or whatever, eh? What does that say to us? Mm -hmm. uh, you don't just point to one person, you point to everybody so that mm -hmm. everybody pays attention. Mm -hmm. That's it. I was just thinking too about what you said, you know, about uh, the behavior and uh, how we stress always, you know, that negative. And I remember uh, thinking, you know, that we have to do something different yeah. to keep those kids in school, you know, because like you said, you know, if they're, if they're out of school, if they're sent home, what do we send them home with? Yeah. You know? They're, Nothing. Like There's no say, follow up. They're just doing their games or whatever, you know? So there has to be a follow-up, but there also has to be, you know, that uh, I think restitution when they come back to school. You know, mm -hmm. like you were saying they're running down the hallway, kicking lockers, or you know, doing damage. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we have to teach that positive stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, the teaching of how to behave and why it's, why we want them to behave. Not so much the negative, because you know. Honestly, like most of our jails and uh, institutions are filled with people that mm -hmm. didn't have that mm -hmm. teaching. Mm -hmm. And, you know, stats are saying that most of those people in there are First Nation people. Yeah. And we wonder why, you know, because that teaching has to be there from home. There's a deeper and root. And reinforced in the, in the schools, you know. Mm -hmm. There's a deeper root. Yeah. Because I, I think back to being a child and, you know, my very first memory is, you know, not speaking English, mm -hmm. you know. Like when I wanted to go to the bathroom, like I was told I have to say it in English and my brothers were teaching me at home. So my very first time, that uh, first day of school, right after recess, you know, when I didn't go and use a bathroom outside, I came in, and as soon as I sat down, I knew I had to have a pee. But when I asked that teacher, well, I raised my hand, because they told me, you gotta raise your hand. <laughs> so then, you know, and when you raise your hand, it, it even makes it worse. <laughs> you know, that urge, you know? <laughs> so then, when I raised my hand, all those words went out of my head, you know, the, the English words. Yeah. And so I said it to him in Cree, because that's what I knew. And there was no response, none whatsoever, because he's trained to do that. You know, I didn't know that. And so, you know, my first day of school, I was sent home yeah. because I did the most natural thing in the world, you know, then couldn't do it anywhere else. He won't let me go out. <laughs> Second day, same thing. The third day I went home, my mom said, if you're going to do this once more, you're staying home the rest of the school year. And I thought, oh, because you see, that teacher went to see her, and I didn't know that. Eh? And so when I went back to school, I still did my thing, you know, like my brother said, make sure you go and use a toilet before you go back in. And, but I was too busy playing, you know, and having fun, and by the time I went in, I'd forgotten. And as soon as I sat down, and I knew again, eh? And I'm sitting there, and I am just sitting there doing my best not to. And uh, I did everything. And then the guy next in the next row to me, you know, where I'm in grade one, one and two, and then the grade three and four, and the guy in grade three, right at the front row. All of a sudden, I seen his hand go up. And uh, he's been there now to, you know, three, going on in his third year, and he still didn't know the rule, you know, that was imposed on us. And uh, as soon as he raised his hand, and he told the teacher what he had to do, you know, nobody said nothing. None of us responded. None of us snickered or nothing, you know. And the wee machine, mm. you know. Nobody said nothing. And so... That teacher didn't say nothing. He didn't respond to him, and he did what comes natural. And we sat there, and we could, we knew the misery he was in, but we also knew the smell. 
and we couldn't do nothing. And we had to sit there right till lunch hour. As soon as that, as soon as the bell rang, that because he rang a little bell that said it was lunchtime, everyone shot out of there. You know, there was no waiting around. And uh, he went home, and that little guy never came back to school. Mm. He never came back to school. They they took him back to his uh, other grandparents in uh, in Barrens. But you know, that's when I realized, you know, the the far-reaching effects of, uh, of of that behavior to us that was natural for every child, but to be punished for it, you know, there was also justice involved there, the unfairness, because when I did that, and I lived across the river, and we came across to the school, you know, in uh, in a boat, and. You know, one of the older boys would row us across to the school. And that, that day I did that. He didn't ask any of my brothers to take me home. He asked the oldest boy in that class in grade eight. His name was Herman. Told Herman to, I guess he told, told Herman to take me home. And I looked at him and I looked at my brothers and my brothers couldn't say nothing or do anything. And I thought, why didn't he ask my brothers? You know, as a child, I knew I had enough sense of dignity to not want to go on a boat with this big guy, you know, and I knew I peed my pants. And so he asked this boy, and the boy took me home. He never said a word to me. He never laughed at me or anything. Got home, and he told my mom. And I realized then, you know, I, you know that there's something with his system that's not right. First of all, I had to say, you know, what I needed to do in, in his language. And the second thing was I was punished. But the third thing was in that boy doing what he did, I sat there, and to this day I always think my health was affected because, you know what, I, I kept it in. I sat there, I don't know what I did. But there was no way I was going to go home. No way. But then I thought, how come he, he didn't ask Herman to take that boy home? And he didn't. And many of us grew up in situations like that, you know, where not only was our dignity affected, uh, the respect for who we were, who we were in our language, but also, you know, our health. You know, we have, we all do things that are natural in this world. And one of them being, you know, that you know, if you have to go to the bathroom, you go to the bathroom. And our parents, as long as I was living with my parents and grandparents. There was never any issue about that, about having to use the bathroom. In fact, they were the most supportive because we didn't have indoor plumbing, you know. And so we always had, you know, for nighttime, <coughs> we had a chamber pot. Other, other than that, you went to the outdoor buffet. And, and to me, those lessons I think we learned because of the negative, they were harsh long-lasting in many different ways, you know. So I would say, you know, to, to those that are going to be working with our children, you know, know that. Know where to draw the line. Know what a child needs. And, you know, that child you're talking about, mm -hmm. that little one that, that was holding you, you know. Mm -hmm. My goodness, if every, if every one of us in teaching did that, with our child, with our children that we worked with, to be able to acknowledge that basic need to be to be needed, cared for, and loved. I think I think our children would be would excel in every area of their life if mm -hmm. we were all allowed to do that, mm -hmm. and and to give them that that measure of respect for their individualness. So I, I liked what you said. Sure, mm -hmm. opened my eyes too. There's, I just wanted to share something with you. That um, Amber School, there where I go every once. These, there, it's all uh, immigrants. Mm -hmm. The children are all immigrant children. Mm -hmm. Incredible school, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very incredible. I went into grade two, four, eight, and three. So I'm, 
I was at that uh, grade two school for, um, no, grade three. And all these kids are all immigrant kids like East Indian and whatever. Anyway, you know what the question they asked me? They said, how many nations are there in Canada? Said this little guy. I said, well, so there we, we used to have so many, like a hundred. But in the United States and Canada, there was 200 nations when these people from the other side came. So I was giving them a whole bunch of information. And they said, what about the languages? Mm -hmm. Little kids, grade three. They said, what about your languages? How many languages do you have? So I told them. He says, well, what's the difference between this language and that language and so on? So what I got up, those kids are thinking different mm -hmm. from other kids that I've seen in classrooms because they're uh, from across the ocean there where they, I guess they have different groups of people. So I, I was... I gave them a map and so on, and they're really interested. And I said, you know, I just want to tell you something else. We have 28 areas of right across the country of Canada and the United States and South America. Sacred spots. They're sacred the medicine wheels, and so on and so forth. So each tribe has sacred spot. So I was telling them all that. And I was telling them a little bit about our ways, the Anishinaabe ways. <laughs> but they were so interested in everything that we, we knew about our own country. Mm -hmm. They're incredible. They're so wanting to know about this new country that they've come to. So the first thing I told them, this, you know what? Thank you for asking about the first peoples of North America. And I'll teach you more Great. if you're really interested in it. I said, yeah, we're interested. But you know, in our own classrooms on, in our reserves, they don't even teach those. And that really, bothers me. You know, the, they don't teach the language, they don't teach the, anything about if they had sacred sites, what kinds of, uh, um, what, what kind of life did we have, and so on and so forth, and you know, what the Anishinaabe people did, and, and so on and so forth. They don't teach that in our reserves maybe a little bit but they don't teach them culture they don't teach them history you know and so that's really sad and here in 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 the city they're teaching them their our culture they're teaching them their history our history mm -hmm. and these teachers that are going to be teaching they have to know what's really important. Mm -hmm. And no more of this where, well, yeah, Canada was whatever they say, 15 whatever. But they have to start teaching that we've been here forever. Mm -hmm. They have to start teaching our, our, the way that our people mm -hmm. think about the history and so on and the language and so on. If I talked to, if I went to one of the schools in, in Manitoba and asked them in grade three or four, those were grade three and four that I'd, mm -hmm. I'd go and see. I bet you they won't know. Mm -hmm. Or they want to know? I don't think so. So there's a, uh, to me, First Nation people 
they better get on the boat of teaching the kids the real history of uh, North America and really teach them what happened. The long walks of Cherokee and Navajo and so on. All that and South America, what they did. I mean, otherwise, these people that come over, the immigrants and, and whatever, you know, who comes here to be an American or Canadian, they'll still think of us as uh, savages, that we don't have a history. And so what happens is that our young people come into stores and so on, so they're, you know, somebody is pointing at them. They don't even do anything. And the storekeepers and so on are throwing them out. Mm -hmm. So, as, you know, that has to really change. And these, these people that are going to be trained as teachers, that's what they have to look at. They have to look at our history. They have to look at our, our languages. They have to look at what our teachings are all about. Those little immigrants, they want to know the teachings mm -hmm. they, because they're, they've got teachings and they have songs and they have all their bundles. Mm -hmm. Like our little kids, some of them will know. But generally, you wouldn't have them know. They won't know. So that's what I think that these mm -hmm. teachers that are going to, especially special ed teachers, they got to know the history of this country, the real history, yeah. and not somebody else's yeah. thoughts. Or even how somebody else think yeah. about what our history is, you know? Exactly. I know there is a. I know they are starting uh, educational programs today, uh, in Fish River, for for instance. Uh, they have the land-based program, mm -hmm. and uh, the gentleman that's running that program, Jerry Mason, you know, one of our, you know, top-notch educators down there, runs mm -hmm. an excellent program. Mm -hmm. His uh, there is a, a young man in Peguis. Uh, that's also running a land-based program, Bernie McCorster. And, uh, you know, I have to say for for these gentlemen, you know, and what they're doing, because they involve us elders in their programs. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, starting to starting to teach our children, you know, their history. Mm -hmm. You know, and you said hands-on, you know, like using mm -hmm. the hands, you know, like looking at the plants, looking at the animals, what they give to us and how we how we uh, take from those animals and plants and what we give back to them. And it's always, you know, with, uh, I think, with a measure of respect, you know, for, for our traditional lands. But I think the important thing there is how, how do we take care of that land? What kind of stewards are we? And that's what they're teaching because that's our history. Because we are a land-based people. We are... Uh, a people that uh, know that that everything that was created was for us with a purpose, but in in that in that teaching, we do have to give back, you know, in one way or another, to look after those animals the best that we can, all the creation, because without them we wouldn't be here. In so, the language, yeah, and the language is there too. So I, I know it's exciting when we start talking about land based in our mm -hmm. communities and uh, that's I think the, the best way right now because it includes all aspects of the culture, the teachings and the language. So I think this is a start uh, and I'm hoping that uh, that you will uh, you know talk to uh, you know to all your cohorts and uh, and, and let them know you know that uh, I think in, in everything that you do, that there has to be a meeting taking place first with those elders in those communities, those parents, and then making sure that you're following the proper protocol in doing that. I think that uh, it will, you know, a program like this will succeed as long as you're working with that other partner of yours. 
who is our, our First Nations people or non-First Nations people, I think it, it will succeed because it, our future depends on us working together, not working against each other, but together. So thank yous. Mm-hmm. Thank yous. Thank yous for this opportunity. Yeah, extra me, what? We'd like to sincerely thank all of our elders for sharing their knowledge and wisdom with us today. We know that the advice and guidance they have provided are going to help our current teachers and teachers of tomorrow in being inclusive of Indigenous perspectives in Manitoba schools. Thank you.